The tip of the iceberg hides the true depth underwater, by Debbie Blue. This was not a good idea. Hirotsu knew this was not a good idea, and he tried telling Mori that multiple times, yet Mori just smiled and waved him off. The boys will be fine, Hirotsu's son. What's the worst that can happen? What's the worst thing that could happen as Okoku's newly assigned handler? Well, to start, Hirotsu was only assuming this position because the teens managed to kill their last handler and the one before that, and Mori refused to disclose what the boys did to the first one. Little mistakes were made, yet they were enough for the boys to justify death. Double Lack was notoriously protective of each other, despite their claims that their relationship consisted of nothing but professionalism and hatred. No one dared to challenge the boys to their faces, but rumors spread. Who was that violent to those who crossed their supposedly despised partner? Hirotsu had witnessed what happened to those who stepped too close to them. A spy nicked Dazai when they tried to slash his neck. They were found dead hours later. The cause? Falling from the top of a building, although most of their bones had been crushed long before that as well. Someone got a little too handsy with Nakahara? The next day they were in the hospital with severed fingers. So what was the worst that could happen? There was a multitude of answers, none of which Hirotsu ever wanted to experience. Yet, he resigned himself to face his inevitable fate and was waiting outside their apartment the next morning. Hopefully he'd lived through his first day. The good news was that Dazai and Nakahara hated this arrangement as much as he did. They didn't like him following them around. He knew they tried getting rid of him. In fact, they tried to take it up with the boss himself. Hirotsu waited outside the door, and after a nice, long talk, the issue was dropped. The glares he received before were nothing compared to the hatred in their eyes he now saw every time they passed him. But they couldn't outright order him to leave them alone, so they did whatever they could to avoid him. One minute they'd be walking in front of him, the next gone. Nakahara would be sparring in the training room, spot Hirotsu, then book it. They especially did not like that he knew where they lived, and dropped them off relatively often. They insisted he stopped at a random park, but Hirotsu reluctantly informed them that Mori had already given him their address. Dazai was on the phone in seconds, supposedly with Mori, and only got a few sharp words before he fell silent and listened to whatever the boss had to say. Nakahara, on the other hand, glowed a dangerous red as his eyes stayed firmly on the back of the chair in front of him. Hirotsu had to request a new car considering the damage the temperamental teen had inflicted on it without trying, or, more probable, while holding himself back. None of this was surprising. He knew how difficult it would be to get them to trust him or tolerate him. He would definitely settle for that as well. It was easy enough to get Nakahara to temporarily trust people so they could work together, and Dazai to rely on because trust was too strong a word to describe Dazai's relationship with his pawns. Others every now and then. But when it came to each other, no chance they trusted a single soul with their partner. Hirotsu didn't know Nakahara that well, but Dazai's reputation preceded him. Being on Dazai's bad side was worse than death. Hirotsu had seen the executive's cruelty with his own eyes when he had to enter the torture chambers to give Dazai information or direct him towards where Mori wanted him next and these random men Dazai tormented to the point of insanity were not on his bad side. No, this was the clinical side. Sadistic tendencies as strong as Dazai's couldn't be hidden, but Hirotsu knew that the demon he was seeing in front of him, covered in somebody else's blood and smiling as he dragged a knife through nerves and skin with unmatched precision, was Dazai going easy. Many mafia members couldn't look at the remains of the poor bastards who dared cross the demon prodigy without feeling ill. And Hirotsu was already towing the line between Dazai's good and bad side due to his position alone. But there came a time when they couldn't be together, couldn't protect each other at their most vulnerable. It started with a gang war. Some smaller, meaningless gangs in Yokohama and surrounding areas had grouped together with the backing of an international crime organization that wanted to take Yokohama for themselves. As expected, they came straight for the Port Mafia. Mori was confident that this wouldn't be a lasting issue. It would be solved after a few battles when the Port Mafia exemplified its superiority. He wasn't wrong. The Port Mafia had the advantage. Both sides could see that they were going to win. But that didn't mean getting to victory was an easy path. They were a week into the war. Dazai and Nakahara had been in and out of headquarters faster than Hirotsu could keep track of. They were going for the back lines. The strongholds occasionally with a small squad or two, while the rest of the mafia was fighting the front lines. There were a lot more locations and people to obliterate than any of them had realized, and as a result, the boys were run ragged. 
Hirotsu hadn't seen them stop to rest for more than a few hours at a time over the last week. Their faces stayed determined. Their banter stayed consistent. It seemed like they weren't impacted at all by the days without sleep. They were good at hiding it, Hirotsu had to admit, but he knew there was no way they weren't worn out at this point. Then, there was a shift when they'd both stumbled into headquarters, or, more accurately, Dazai stumbled in carrying an unconscious Nakahara on his back, both bloody and dirty. Fitting, considering the conditions they'd been in nonstop for a week. Hirotsu was used to seeing others' blood adorning Dazai's person, but seeing his own, at least enough to be noticed, was rare. Yet here he was. Forehead bleeding, arms torn up, and blood dripping down his leg with every limp he took. His face held no signs of pain or botheration. Hirotsu met them at the headquarter doors and trailed silently behind them towards the infirmary. He wasn't stupid enough to offer help to Dazai with his knocked-out partner. Nurses came rushing toward to take Nakahara into the infirmary, but Dazai only glared at them and tightened his grip. It would be wise if you moved aside, if you would like to keep your hands. They all jolted away from him and parted so he had a clear path to his destination. The demon prodigy didn't bluff, and the idiots who thought he did ended up dead permanently injured or traumatized for life, if not in a combination of the last two. And now, covered in blood and grime, he looked more threatening, like he'd just crawled his way out of hell. Dazai walked into the infirmary and laid Nakahara on one of the beds on the far side of the room with achingly careful hands, unfit for the demon prodigy, unseen. This time, he allowed the staff to approach, but stayed right next to Nakahara watching with hawk eyes as they set up IVs and started examining Nakahara's wounds. Triple checked every IV bag, blood bag, or equipment going in or near Nakahara's body. Chuya had to use corruption. It lasted longer than usual. Daz, I said, his voice sounded bitter and strained. After days of yelling orders when he had men under his command, it was likely sore and overused. Hirotsu didn't know much about corruption. All he knew was that Nakahara activated it and only Daz, I could stop it. If he had to guess, he'd say Dazai felt guilty for allowing this ability to prolong and extend the already grave harm his partner received. His self-reproach made him even more cautious and suspicious of those around him. Now, a stronger need to protect his partner weighed on his shoulders where he failed before, which meant it would be difficult for the medical staff to do their job in a timely manner. Someone came running in and stopped before Dazai. The man bowed respectively before speaking. Dazai-san! Mori gave me orders to inform you that you are to lead the next wave of attacks. Your squad is waiting for you outside. Dazai stood his ground, eyes hard on the unfortunate messenger who was given this task. No, tell Mori I will not be leading the next attack. The goon gulped. Dollhouse. Dazai's eyes narrowed, burning holes into the sweating man. There was a gun pressed against the goon's forehead before Hirotsu could even realize what was happening. The safety turned off and Dazai's finger on the trigger. I wouldn't recommend threatening me with words you don't know the meaning of if I were you, Dazai said coolly. Morrison told me to say the word dollhouse if you refused, the man squeaked in a frightened manner as he squeezed his eyes shut. Hirotsu wanted to scoff at this weakling. Didn't he know Dazai could smell fear, sought it out and gorged on it as if it were the food he needed to keep his belly full? But Dazai froze. Not obvious to anyone but Hirotsu at the moment, who had spent so much time around Dazai recently. He was starting to pick up on his subtle body language. Dazai glanced down at Nakahara, fingers twitching as if he wanted to reach out to his partner. Dazai begrudgingly lowered the gun and tucked it away. The goon almost collapsed, eased now that he didn't have one of the most dangerous men in the mafia pointing a weapon at him. Dazai-san, I will watch over Nakahara in your absence. A risky move on Hirotsu's part. Even the suggestion of voluntarily being close to Nakahara was dangerous. Dazai's head turned to look at him, examined him, with wariness and dark promises emitting from his being. But Hirotsu and Dazai knew that the boy didn't have an actual choice, though. Whatever Mori threatened was not worth this disobedience in Dazai's eyes. Hirotsu wasn't sure he wanted to know what scared the fearless demon prodigy into submission. When Dazai's lips parted, a low warning slithered out. If anything happens to him, I guarantee you'll wish I settled for cutting off your fingers and breaking your bones. Hirotsu bowed his head. Show no fear. To be around Dazai was always a game that everyone around him seemed to be losing. The only way to stay in the game was to keep weakness locked deep inside, far away from Dazai's claws. I understand, sir. No harm will come to Nakahara-san in my care. Dazai stiffly nodded, and when no eyes were on him except for Hirotsu's, 
The feared executive patted Nakahara's hand, lingering over it for a moment. He wanted to do more. This wasn't how Dazai wanted to leave. I'll be back soon, Chibi. Don't die without me. And then he was gone, storming out of the infirmary, the goon Mori sent hot on his heels. He was beginning to understand why Daze didn't want to leave Nakara here, in this location, in this state. Now that he's thought about it, he doesn't think he's ever seen Sokoku post-corruption and doubted anyone else had either. The only reason he knew it occurred at all was because Daze and Nakahara had a few days off afterwards. Did Daze always take care of Nakahara alone? The thought was absurd. Daze was too heartless and mechanical to consider wasting time tending to someone. Yet, he didn't want to leave Nakahara's side. Yet, he looked excruciatingly uncomfortable leaving Nakahara in the hands of others. The least Hirotsu could do was ease Daze's worries and keep the unconscious boy in front of him safe for the time being. So he stood there, unmoving from his position, other than to check all medical supplies or to stop people and question them before they approached Nakahara. And when the staff stuck around longer than needed or any stragglers passed, Hirotsu ordered them away. Although the mafia was safe, especially in the infirmary, there was always a chance that an assassin managed to slip in. Never did he slack. Never did he lower his guard. That's how people got killed. And Hirotsu would not allow that to happen to a person in his charge. After six hours, Daze came walking back into the infirmary at a fast pace, as if he were holding himself back from running and, in turn, looking like a child. He made a beeline for them, and his shoulders drooped in relief when he saw Nakahara safe and alive. He checked all of Chuya's vitals and every liquid bag or medicine around them before acknowledging Hirotsu was there. Daze looked exhausted. Now that he turned towards Hirotsu, less than three feet away, Hirotsu could see his greasy hair and sunken cheeks eyes blinking heavily and widening as he tried to keep them open and unsteady on his feet, and somehow, more blood had gotten on his clothes, soaking through the bandages at this point. Report. His tone was steady and commanding, like a mafia executive should be. Hirotsu knew better. Daze was nothing but a scared teenager at the moment. No incidents to report, Daze-san. Everything went smoothly. Did you check all the IVs? Yes, Daze-san. And you ensured all the people approaching him were friendlies? I questioned every person who came in close proximity to Nakahara-san. Dazai nodded and trudged over to Nakahara's bed. Hirotsu grabbed a chair nearby and placed it next to the bed for Dazai to sit in. And again, those inquisitive eyes, questioning every action, every movement Hirotsu made. Dazai allowed himself to sit in the chair as a show of gratitude and trust. Also, because he looked like he would fall over if he had to stand for much longer. The battle seemed to be over for the day, or at least the large waves were. The infirmary was full of wounded mafiosos, but Nakara's bed was pushed into one of the corners of the room with a curtain around it, secluded from everyone. Daza slumped in the chair and rested his head on Nakara's bed with his back to Hirotsu. Hirotsu stood there in appalled silence. Dazai, the least trusting member of the mafia, save for the mafia boss himself, allowing himself to be exposed because he knew he trusted Hirotsu to protect them. Even if it was a fragile trust, Hirotsu was honored to have it. He would be damned if he broke that trust. After that, things got easier. Well, as easy as things could get with Sokoku. They became less wary, a little more relaxed, no longer ran from him, allowing him to shadow them and speaking to him every now and then, usually wanting an opinion on whatever they were arguing about. It admittedly became less terrifying to go against one of them, though just in these instances... It was nice to see them have fun and badger him when he took one side over the other. It was playful in a way Hirotsu had never seen them act towards anyone other than each other. The longer he spent with them, the more he realized how they acted at headquarters. The bickering and yelling and pissing each other off was just the tip of the iceberg of their relationship. There was more there, something deeper, something intimate, that they fought to keep the world from knowing. Sometimes, for a second or two, he would see their masks slip. A loud bang and Nakahara would extinctually reach for Dazai. Dazai keeping himself between Nakahara and every other mafia member they had to interact with or pass. Nakahara never commented on it, despite definitely noticing the fact and even allowed Dazai to do it. At the end of long days, he would walk into one of their offices to take them home and see them leaning against each other, just enough to brush shoulders or see Dazai's feet on Nakahara's lap as they reviewed paperwork. Small but it was definitely there.
There were still some things they absolutely shut down about, stacking those walls on as high as they could possibly go, and reinforced them with steel. He was never allowed in their home, no matter if one of them was unconscious and needed to be carried. He was not allowed to stand in Drang there or Daz's individual meetings with Mori. He grew more and more concerned about that one when he saw Daza go in fine and come out bruised and walking as if each step hurt. And he most definitely was not allowed to touch either of them. He had learned that the hard way when he accidentally brushed Daza's shoulder when Daza wasn't expecting it. The demon prodigy flinched, but as everything was with him, was barely noticeable he went blank, eyes hazing over in an alarming rate and not indicating he was aware of anything around him. Thank God he was in good graces with them, because if he wasn't, he's sure he'd be dead. Instead, Nakahara forcefully shoved himself between them, pushing Hirotsu back in the process and glared at him. Don't fucking touch him! Then stalked away, pulling a pliant Dazai with him by the wrist. Hirotsu didn't follow. But the walls could only hold so long, especially with his responsibilities towards them and their forced closeness due to the nature of his position. The walls first started to crumble after a mission. Per usual, he drove them home after the mission. The mission had happened to be a rough one from what Hirotsu could gather. Nakara's arm had been broken in two places from what the doctor said, and Dazai was unconscious due to a blow to his head and had a twisted ankle. The ride was silent, which wasn't unexpected. Hard missions that didn't go the way they planned or ended in more casualties than intended always led to wordless rides home. Nakahara looked particularly affected every time they went into a mission with a certain number of men and came out with less. A somber mood suffocated the car on those days. Narkahara would blandly stare out the window, resting his head against the glass as Daze glanced at him every now and then, a poorly concealed worry written on his face that even Hirotsu could decipher. The car parked in front of the building. narkahara son. I believe it would be wise for me to carry Daze into your apartment as you are currently incapacitated. Hirotsu said once they reached the building. In true Nakahara fashion, he sneered and told Hirotsu to fuck off. I can do it myself. He got out of the car and attempted to grab Dazai. Hirotsu respected the boy's determination to keep him the hell away from their living space. These hopeless attempts to get Dazai out of the car went on for 20 minutes before Nakahara gritted his teeth and kicked the concrete beneath his feet. Hirotsu saw any need assistance, he ground out. The word sounded physically painful to say. Hirotsu exited the vehicle and walked around to the back seat doors. May I touch him, Nakahara-san? Nakahara startled, obviously not expecting Hirotsu to ask for permission. He muttered a small confirmation, and Hirotsu slipped his arms underneath Dazai and lifted him out of the car. He was lighter than expected. It wouldn't be a surprise if Nakahara, despite their height difference, weighed more than him. Nakahara started walking towards the building, so Hirotsu dutifully followed. They arrived at the door. Nakahara reached for the handle but hesitated. He then opened his mouth to say something but closed it just as quick, scowling instead. If Hirotsu had to name an emotion to describe Nakahara right now, nervousness would be the first thing that came to mind. Not usually a word he would consider associating with the gravity manipulator. Yet, here they were. Just put him on the couch. Nakara snapped as he tapped his foot against the door. Hands crossed over his chest and closely monitoring Hirotsu. The elder man followed the instructions, trying not to look around, but he couldn't help it. It looked so... homey. There were little things here and there that screamed domestic and warmth, so unlike Sokoku's cold exteriors. At least two blankets were draped over the couch. Hoodies and baseball caps hung from the hat rack alongside their suit jackets. Cozy furniture and a cat? That's Meatloaf. Ignore him, Nakara said as the cat rubbed against his legs. Did Hirotsu expect the two Mafia members with the highest kill count to have a fat cat and mismatched furniture? No, he did not. Was he going to say anything? No, he would not. He did value his life to some degree. Hirotsu nodded at Chuyu's command and set Dazai on the couch. Will that be all, Nakara-san? Yes, now get out. He wasn't offended and understanding dawned on him as to why they didn't want anyone in their apartment except them. It was their home, not just somewhere they retired at the end of the day. Whoever they truly were when the facades came down, whatever emotions or fear they'd been hiding could be released without worry of repercussions in their home. It was a sacred space for them. Hirotsu didn't want to ruin that.
So the older mafioso left, expecting to never see the inside of the apartment again. Yet, two months later, he got a call. Hirotsu san, I need you to bring a 15 milligram IV of morphine in an IV pole and water bottles to the apartment, Daza said, voice low as if he was trying not to disturb someone. Hirotsu hesitated. He knew of Dazai's suicidal tendencies, but he also knew that 15 milligrams of morphine was not enough to get anywhere close to an overdose, nor did he believe Dazai would simply ask his handler to retrieve it if the intention was overdosing. Of course, Dazai san, I'll be over right away. Don't knock. Your fingerprint is in our security system, and there is a key in your apartment taped to the bottom of the bed. Be quick. Dazai hung up, unknowingly leaving Hirotsu speechless. They trusted him. Actually trusted him now. There's no way he'd get a key to their home if they didn't. He wasn't sure how they got his fingerprint, but this was Dazai. The boy that could do anything he set his mind to. Getting a fingerprint was child's play. Hirotsu headed to the infirmary, grabbed what was requested of him, and headed to the store to get the second item Dazai had wished for. There was a store five minutes from Sokoku's apartment, so he quickly stopped by, purchasing a container of water bottles, and was back on his route to the apartment. He couldn't deny he was curious. Why did Dazai need morphine and water bottles? Before he knew it, he was standing in front of their door, supplies in hand. He steadied himself and took a breath. He wasn't sure what he was going to walk into but he had to be calm and collected as always. He unlocked it and pushed the door open. The boys were nowhere to be seen, but Hirotsu heard them. Screams, coming from one of the bedrooms followed by ragged sobs. It hurts, he heard Nakara pant. Dazai, it hurts, please, please. And then there was Dazai's voice. Speaking so faintly, Hirotsu barely heard him. I know it hurts, Chuya, I know. It'll be over soon. And that was Dazai's voice, soft and comforting. A tone he'd never heard on the boy, nor one he had ever expected to hear. Hirotsu went to the kitchen and started putting the water bottles in the fridge and setting up the IV pole. Dazai had not asked him here to fix whatever problem they were having. He was here to drop off medicine and water. That was all. It's so loud, Nakara choked. He, it won't stop. It's only getting worse. A pained whine was followed by another heartbreaking scream, more crying, though it sounded muffled, like his face was pressed against something. God, please make it stop. Please, Osama. The morphine will be here soon, slug. Just hang on a little longer, does I murmured. Hirotsu closed the fridge as lightly as he could, hoping it wouldn't make a sound and disturb the boys. He understood what the morphine was for now. How often did Nakahara go through this horrible pain? What was causing this? Questions, so many questions swirled through his head that he had absolutely no right to ask or think of. I need him out. I can't do this. I can't. Nakahara's voice was rising in pain, induced panic. A loud slam made Hirotsu jump in surprise. You're going to give yourself a headache if you keep doing that, does I said, as a minor reprimand, before hushing Nakahara with soothing low noises as Nakahara wept and mumbled unintelligible things. Hirotsu headed for the door once he finished setting up the IV. I want it to stop, Nakura hiccuped, his tone desperate and distressed. He was too far to hear what Dazai said in return. As he closed the door to leave, another round of screaming began. He'd seen Nakahara walk out of literal torture with a grin on his face, even when his bones were broken and his skin was bruised or littered with cuts and marks. If Nakahara barely reacted to the pain inflicted on him during torture, and rarely made a sound other than smart-ass comments, what could possibly cause him to scream and beg Dazai to help him? Once he got to the car, he texted Dazai that everything had been delivered and was in their kitchen waiting for him. Then he drove home. The entire ride, Nakahara's shrieks and Dazai's caring words played in his mind. Hirotsu knew he was the only person in the world who saw Sokoku like this, and it was not something he took lightly. He knew what their trust meant, how hard it was to earn and maintain. A decision was made. He wouldn't betray their trust. What he had heard was never to be spoke of or hinted at. These children deserved at least that much. They deserved to feel safe in the privacy of their home when all the hell they dealt with daily ended. A few hours of rest, or comfort at the least, and then it would restart and it did. The next day, they came into headquarters bickering as if nothing had happened. The only evidence of last night was the dark circles around both of their eyes. The whole day, Dazai wouldn't let Nakahara's arm out of his reach, and Nakahara didn't seem to mind, if anything, relaxing more as he got closer to Dazai. Dazai did not thank him for fulfilling his request. No, 
Their weakness and vulnerability could not be mentioned in public. Not even a simple thank you for helping them would be safe from all the people that wanted to hurt them. He did, however, get a small nod from Daza in acknowledgement. I know what you did for us, and I won't forget it. Hirotsu tilted his head in response. They shared a mutual understanding that Hirotsu was on their list of trusted allies now. The only other person on that list to his knowledge was Koyu. Mori had never been on that list. Even if he was the last person alive, Hirotsu was sure of that. So for now, he could bask in the warm pride in his chest as he watched Nakahara smack the back of Dazai's head and yell at him for who knows what. While Dazai responded with his usual pout and teasing words that only made Nakahara more worked up. For now, this was more than enough for him.